Ok. Attenzione. Okay, we're starting. The, um, the village has seasons. Um, this is actually the, the uh, top of the atmosphere incoming solar radiation as a function of obliquity. And lat so latitude here top of the atmosphere insulation for varying obliquities. Earth is not on here. Earth is 23 or something. I'm not very good with the real world sometimes. Uh, it's 23. So, um, of course, zero obliquity uh, is this line here. As you increase the obliquity, um, it's rather interesting. Well, perhaps it's easier to understand this one. More. This is the incoming solar radiation at solstice, when the when the uh, sun is overhead uh, at the uh, latitude of obliquity. So, if there's no obliquity, of course, you still get the same plot. Most incoming solar radiation at the equator, as you increase the obliquity, you get more and more incoming solar radiation coming in at higher and higher latitudes. When the obliquity is 90 degrees, uh, then, of course, the sun is overhead at the pole, and, uh, and the pole gets very warm. Um, and you get a reverse temperature gradient. And it, you don't need much obliquity uh, in order. So here, the obliquity is 30 degrees. When the obliquity is 30 degrees, which is not much more than today's obliquity, then in summer you have more incoming solar radiation at the pole than you do at the equator, even though the pole is further uh, from 30 than the equator is from 30. But the length of the day is much longer, so you have to take that into account. And then, uh, and then perhaps a little bit more surprising is that when the obliquity is actually above 54 degrees, it turns out, then on the annual, on the annual mean you get more incoming solar radiation at the pole than you do at the equator. So if you've got, so even with our, I mean, the obliquity is about 23 and a half or something like that. And, of course, and it has varied slightly over, over the millennia, not so much, but a few degrees here and there. Uh, and the variations in the obliquity are thought to be, give rise to the ice ages. That's the famous theory of Milutin Milankovic. Um, it's interesting. It's still a little bit of an unsolved problem. Lots of people think they've solved the problem um, as to how the actual variations in obliquity give rise to the ice ages. Um, but, uh, but they seem to do so. Mars has had very large variations in obliquity over the past uh, a few billions of years. It's about 30 degrees now, I, th I think, a bit less. Um, it may have been as large as 60 in the past because Mars is closer to Jupiter. So, and it's the other planets which give rise to variations in obliquity. But, but nonetheless, even with our current obliquity of 23, we get pretty strong seasons. Um, so the basic upshot of that is that we get the Hadley cell is not centered at uh, the equator. Um, if this rises uh, in, the, in the summer hemisphere, this is the rising motion, essentially the ITCZ, uh, and you get a much stronger winter cell and a weaker summer cell. Um, and there's a, there's a corresponding theory for that, although Again, there are many theories for this. Um, the theory most related to the held how theory for the, uh, for the seasonal case is uh, Linzen and how. 
uh, how was a student actually uh, at MIT in the late 70s did a lot of this. Um, the, it, and of course it becomes, I don't know whether Simone will talk about this or not, but uh, part of it is that this, of course, is not a steady state. The, the seasons are going back and forth, and the back and forth, essentially the back and forth of the winter cell and the summer cell are the monsoons, in a sense. Um, we shouldn't we shouldn't separate them too much, uh, but the monsoons tend to be concentrated in various regions like India, Southeast Asia, a weak monsoon in Arizona even, uh, because of the influence of continents. Uh, and, uh, but we probably shouldn't think of the continents as causing the monsoon any more than we think of the convection as, as causing um, the Hadley cell, but nonetheless, if we didn't have the continents, the monsoons would not be like they are today. But that's, uh, I won't talk about that at all. I'll talk about that. Good. <laughs> all right. Good. Okay. So I'll lead into the main event. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and Helden, sorry, Lindsay and Howe um, did this various, it's more or less, it's the same kind of theory, except now the, uh, the air is rising off the equator, um, and uh, and they do a, they go through the mathematics, uh, and they get the same kind of. Uh, this is the temperature in this. Well, uh, let me have a look. This is the angular momentum conserving temperature here. Uh, and the e equilibrium temperature. So it's, um, I would say this, getting into the off equatorial Hadley cell, you're getting into sort of Cohen research as to, as to and people disagree uh, about the very similitude of the Linz and Howe theory. I would say that the current opinions are that the Linz and Howe theory is quantitatively wrong, uh, partly because it doesn't take into account the unsteadiness, the fact that the seasons are shifting back and forth. It's a, it assumes that we're always in a quasi-steady circulation. Um, but the winter Hadley cell is more or less angular momentum conserving. So you get this much stronger winter cell here and a weaker summer cell here, and or at least the, the experiments, some of the experiments which we've done in our group uh, with Ruth Gein, who will talk about, about it next week, tend to show that the winter cell is a little bit more um, angular momentum conserving and follows the theory of Linzen and Howe, which is a variation of the Held and Howe uh, theory. But the summer cell... Um, which is this guy, uh, really doesn't behave in any shape or form like a, an angular momentum conserving cell. It's, uh, it's really, this cell is really, if you will, driven by the effects of biotonic energies at higher latitudes. And, uh, and going back and forth over the seasons, you actually, so as the seasons progress, I should really have a movie of this, shouldn't I, if I was as adept as as Brian is, this, as the seasons progress, this would shrink, become the summer cell. Um, the summer cell would become the winter cell, and the regime would change from being angular momentum conserving to more of, a, of an eddy-driven cell, and, uh, and that's the progression of the, um, of the seasons. Here are some numerical simulations just to show kind of thing. Uh, this is with a dry model. Um, simulations by Alex Patterson, who's in our group in Exeter. Um, this is a three-dimensional model, full model. Uh, this is the stream function, the temperature. Uh-oh. I think I have... 
this is the problem with talking too long. <laughs> uh, I did some, bring some batteries. <sighs> Let's see if these work. Obliquity is zero, this is the stream function and temperature. This is the annual mean. Um, at the high obliquity, 60 degrees, you're actually seeing uh, warmer poles than you are uh, than at the equator. So it's kind of interesting. But bizarrely enough, surprisingly enough perhaps, you're still seeing on the annual mean a similar structure with Hadley cells uh, close to the equator and feral cells on either side. Oh, sorry, aren't this with the seasonally varying forcing and then you're taking the annual? Yeah, one? yes. You're not forcing it with the annual? No, 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 seasonal forcing. Mm -hmm. So this is a dry model with a um, bit of seasonal varying forcing following astronomy. Um, what is this? This is the actual simulate. This is the actual circulation at solstice. Um, so, this is the winter hemisphere. This is the summer hemis hemisphere. Uh, Thirty degrees obliquity, sixty degrees obliquity. Very warm at the pole. Uh, more or less dominated by a single Hadley cell when you get to high obliquity. Hardly any. There's not, there's neither a feral cell nor is there a summer Hadley cell. Uh, just one single Hadley cell. Interestingly enough though, the Hadley cell does not, still haven't quite understood this, as to why the Hadley cell is not really centered more, uh, it's not centered anywhere close to where it is hottest. It's still concentrated fairly at low latitudes. Um, these are actually zonally symmetric runs now. So we take the, we get rid of all three dimensional effects and just have a zonally symmetric planet, sort of as in the original conception of, oh, of Hadley. Uh, and uh, how and held. I guess if you want to make a contribution to the Hadley cell theory, you should change your name to begin with an H. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Hadley, how. Uh, so, if there are any H's in the audience, you know what your career should be. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, yeah, this is at uh, 60 degrees of liquidity. So, that suggests a strong interhemispheric. Yes, a strong interhemispheric Hadley cell, indeed. Yes. Rising in the summer hemisphere, sinking in the winter hemisphere. But it's still, I mean, this is, it's interesting that this is a three dimensional simulation. Yeah, so uh, this is the zonally symmetric simulation uh, at, uh, at high obliquity. It's not all that much different because you're not getting middle latitude eddies, which give rise to the main differences because you're not getting bioclinic instability. Why don't you go to 90? Oh, we have, but uh, I'm just not showing it here. Sorry. Because this is almost no annual mean temperature. Yeah, we've done it in 92. I just don't have those figures. Sorry. So doesn't anything, does, does it, so does it? No. The answer is no to all your questions. Tell them who would find it in, in that very high ability case. Well, it would be Lindzen and Howe, really, in that. Actually, it doesn't work terribly well. We've done some comparisons, which is part of the reason for doing it dry, between this and uh, Lindzen and Howe. And Lindzen and Howe doesn't work terribly well. Ah, uh, don't know. I have to. I'd have to. I mean, that's, what you, that's how you presented the story, right? The thermal. Well. You've got 
No, it wouldn't necessarily. There wouldn't nec no. There's no. There's no necessary. Con there's no necessary contradiction there, because you can imagine air rising here, uh, moving that way, and then you will get easterlies, because the angular momentum. Oh, I think you shouldn't think about the annual mean. Is the is, <laughs> is the answer to that? Uh, yeah, but held and who? Held and who is is an annual mean theory. Yes, but don't think. But when you have higher obliquity, conserving annual momentum, you're going to generate westerly. Yeah, but the and yet there's going to be easterly winds. I'm not even going to no. going down the annual mean path for high obliquity is. I think you're thinking about it the wrong way. I think you need to think about it separately for the seasons and average them. Yeah. Um, Yes. So, these well run the simulation, which the annual means are deviated. Oh, right. And, and, and at the same time, run the simulation with this, for example, and take the annual means. Have these two experiments the same? Actually, I haven't done that experiment, but it's a good experiment to do. In fact, maybe. We're trying. Okay. They don't look the same. They don't look the same. Yeah, I can imagine. It's so important. I mean, the seasonal. Yeah, I imagine they don't look the same. We might, I, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Heldon has to completely break down. Yeah, yeah, I don't well Heldon Yeah, Heldon how breaks down, yes, indeed. Don't yeah, it, it's it's not gonna work. And I think we yeah, I've been I'm in agreement with so, so I I would have get Pardon? We're the noise TCM. Yeah. Uh the the Hadley cell that you get with the annual means forcing at high obliquity is unstable, Yeah. So, yeah, even with a dry model, I think that'd be different. We may have done that. It's a good, if we haven't done it, we should do it. It's a good, or you guys can do it here. It's actually, it's a little bit hard to do it with a dry model. We aren't, we're not set up for that here. But, uh, but I'll, I'll mark it down. Thank you. There's a, just a, another little problem with Held and Howe, by the way, is that the um, zonal wind is discontinuous uh, in the Held Howe theory. It increases, uh, and then it uh, to the edge of the Hadley cell, and then it drops discontinuously uh, until you get the um, the radiative equilibrium wind. Um, the um, it's interesting if the held how theory or the angular momentum conserving theory um, perhaps seems to actually do better when you slow down the rotation. So this is actually the plots uh, of a fast rotating Earth, a fast rotating planet, slower and still slower. And, and the winds, of course, don't increase as much with latitude when you slow down the rotation because, uh, because omega a is, much, is less, the velocity, the angular momentum conservation has the wind going like omega a so it doesn't uh, so the prediction of the theory is that the Hadley cell extends uh, much longer much further and it's actually quite flat the temperature gradient is quite flat at low rotation rates uh, and so you don't get bioclinic instability the planet isn't rotating fast enough to give you bioclinic instability. Um, so that if you actually perform simulations at low rotation rates, this is Earth. Uh, this is Earth with uh, a tenth of the rotation. This is, well, I shouldn't say Earth. A planet with one tenth of the rotation. This is one hundredth of the rotation, which is approaching Venus. Um, what we're actually plotting is the angular momentum, m, normalized by omega a squared, uh, subtracted by 1. So essentially, where it is all white, um, it's conserving angular momentum. And uh, the three plots, well, look at the top plot. Really, and and the and the bottom plot. These are courtesy of Greg Collier, uh, also at Exeter, 
the zonally symmetric model is actually conserving angular momentum and it's uh, all the way to the edge of the Hadley cell or nearly conserving angular momentum all the way to the Hadley cell though. So the Hadley cell is pushed almost all the way to the pole here. Uh, and um, there's the overturning circulation. So it is kind of obeying the predictions of the theory qualitatively. The Hadley cell is extending further and further. Uh, another phenomenon which then appears in the three-dimensional model is the fact is you get super rotation. And the super rotation meaning that the, um, you get a strong jet at the equator um, at high altitudes. So here the, the air is going around much faster than the planet's surface. And in fact, if you look, uh, that also happens in Venus. In Venus, uh, you've got winds well over 100 meters per second uh, at high altitudes at the equator. The planet is rotating incredibly slowly. It's um, sidereal day, the rotation rate of the, is 1 200th of the Earth. So one can almost wonder on Venus how the winds even know that the planet is rotating. It's going so slowly. Um, but if you take this, it's interesting. We are, again, I haven't shown it. But if you take omega A to be the rotation rate to be 1,000th of the Earth, it finally collapses. The winds finally collapse. Um, and. Uh, uh, the Hadley cell gets pushed off kind of all the way to the all the way to the pole and the winds entirely collapse. Maybe I've got a plot here. Oh yeah. The winds still haven't quite collapsed at one thousandth of the rotation, but they're almost there. So uh, anyway it's kind of interesting to think that these angular momentum conserving theories uh, and going back to Schneider and Venus only has a three degree obliquity. Um, so it's doesn't, so it has no seasons to speak of and it's rotating very slowly. It's kind of interesting to think that these angular momentum conserving uh, type arguments probably apply better to Venus uh, than to Earth. So um, there we go. And is the overturning circulation. Oh, and here's Venus. Uh, here's the um, meridional winds on Venus. So, uh, say, look at this. The left-hand picture, meridional wind is zero, more or less, at the equator. It's positive in the northern hemisphere uh, to about 60 degrees and about 60 degrees also in the southern hemisphere. So we've got a Hadley cell pushing out on Venus to about 60 degrees uh, where it stops. Um, if you apply the theory in our simulations, it actually, we would expect it actually to go even further polewards than 60 degrees, uh, but it doesn't. It, um, the real Venus stops at about 60. And here's another set of uh, observations uh, of the meridional wind here going to about 45 or 50 degrees. Okay, that's, um, that's the end of the Hadley cell, more or less. I want to talk a little bit about tropical dynamics. Uh, well, or keep on talking about tropical dynamics. <laughs> it's rather funny actually thinking about the Hadley cell because somehow Hadley cell is you don't, there's another branch of tropical dynamics. To the, when, you go to the, when you go to the tropics, what do you think about? If you actually go there, you're not thinking, oh, this is a Hadley cell. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, where, where is it? If, if, in fact, if you look around you, what you see are, you see, you know, towering cumulonimbus, uh, you know, going up 12 kilometers. Uh, you feel the moisture, you know, you're sweating like crazy, but it's not evaporating, so you're getting hotter, so you sweat more. <laughs> uh, 
So, and you think, of, and then you think, you go to the, you think of the trade winds and so on. So you, you think, uh, you don't think of the Hadley cell. So, uh, so the whole branch of tropical dynamics, which isn't convex, which isn't to do with the Hadley cell. And uh, so, um, oh, okay. Yes, a complete change in, in uh, I'm going to think about radiation for a minute. Uh, just, so I want to explain why we have a tropopause. And uh, and the main thing I want you to get there are two things I want you to take home is to, at the end of this lecture as to why we have a tropopause. And they're both what it is not caused by. Um, it is not caused by ozone. Uh, we have ozone absorbing heat uh, in the stratosphere. So you might think or be told that uh, temperature starts to increase in the stratosphere and it's falling in the troposphere. And where it turns around to increase because of ozone, that's a tropopause. No. Uh, ozone certainly affects the tropopause, doesn't cause it. The other thing, the other thing which it, you might hear, and you don't really hear it often, so I'm, these are kind of straw men, is that uh, convection goes up, and where the convection stops, that's the tropopause. Well, it sort of is. But why does the convection stop there? It's because the tropopause is there. Uh, it's not, it's not, uh, so all of these things have to be consistent. Um, but there's no particular reason why the tropopause should be at 10 kilometers. And in fact, we'll look at Venus again toward the end. The tropopause on Venus is at 60 kilometers high. Uh, Venus is quite similar in some ways, apart from the rotation uh, to Earth. But, um, okay, so just radiation, just a little bit about radiation. Um, imagine we've got some incoming solar radiation here, outgoing solar radiation out here. And it, some of it will be absorbed uh, in here. And radiation is an incredibly complicated subject. Um, but it's fairly well understood. Uh, but I'm going to make some fairly, uh, mainly I'm going to imagine that radiation is not a big spectrum. It's a single, uh, a single band or two bands. <coughs> We have solar radiation, we have infrared radiation, and that's it. So some comes in, uh, some goes out, some is absorbed, and some is emitted. And the amount that's emitted is proportional to the sigma t to the fourth. And how much is absorbed is called the optical depth, and that's tau. So you can imagine, without too much difficulty, that the I by the tau, which is the change in the radiation, is minus I minus B. So that this first term here tells you that it's absorbed, uh, depending upon the optical depth. Tau and this B, which I will take to be sigma t to the fourth. And that's a, it's called, that's a called a gray assumption. Tells you how much is emitted. So this is a basic equation of radiative transfer. And a lot of 
a lot but not all of the radiative forcing on Earth can be understood by taking the atmosphere to be grey. Uh, but radiation, people who actually know about radiation are actually rather reluctant to make the grey approximation. Uh, one reason is that you can actually do these equations uh, almost line by, well, band by band with, with lots of, with a separate equation for each frequency, and then you sum them all up at the end. And different frequencies have different uh, levels of absorption. And that is important for, um, uh, for, quantitative, uh, for quantitative measurements. Uh, but for now, we'll, we won't worry about that. So we, furthermore, we'll just assume that radiation is going up and down, assume that all the solar radiation is absorbed at the surface. Um, and that's not too bad of an approximation. Uh, so we get an equation for the downwards radiation, imaginatively called D, and the upwards radiation, imaginatively called U. So these are these two equations. The, uh, these are this equation but for the downwards radiation and the upwards radiation. And there's actually a different sign involved because tau, which is the optical depth, we take to be zero at the top of the atmosphere. And whatever it is at the bottom of the atmosphere, it's about five. Um, it tells you how much radiation gets absorbed as you pass through. Uh, so the downwards radiation is going to larger values of tau. The upwards radiation is going to smaller values of tau. You end up with a different sign. Now, tau is a function of the radiation concentration of, of um, excuse me, uh, the, of the atmospheric composition. Uh, the main greenhouse gas in the atmosphere is, what's the main greenhouse gas in the atmosphere? Water vapor, yeah, not carbon dioxide, water vapor. Um, carbon dioxide is number two. Um, and therefore, it's a function of height. Um, if we know what the atmospheric composition is, we can imagine the tower is some function of height. And more or less, it, again, just for, our, just for our purposes, we will assume that tau falls more or less exponentially with height. e to the minus z over h. Uh, and h is the scale height of the absorber. Uh, and because it is water vapor, uh, this scale height is about two kilometers. If we didn't have water vapor in the atmosphere, it would, be, uh, would just be the scale height of the, of the atmosphere itself, which would be about eight kilometers. But in fact, on Earth, it's about two kilometers. Um, so if we know what tau is as a function of z, which we're going to specify here. And we're going to specify then tau is just an, it just becomes a vertical coordinate. And if then the most basic thing you can ask is what is the radiative equilibrium temperature, uh, let's say as a function of height. OK, so we're going to say tau is this tau, tau naught e to the minus z. And if there is the radiative equilibrium temperature, there is no net convergence of radiation in a given level. Because if there's a convergence of radiation, it would mean that the atmosphere is heating. Uh, but 
it, we said it's in equilibrium, so there can't be. Um, so in equilibrium, d bit is z of u minus d, which is the convergence of radiation, again a sign because one is going up and one is going down, is zero. So therefore d bit tau of u minus d must be equal to zero. So that's a condition for radiative equilibrium of a column. <coughs> and I'm assuming no, so, no solar radiation is absorbed, which would be a kind of a detail at the, at the level of this, at the level of this argument. These equations are called the Schwarzschild equations, by the way, or some people call them. I always have trouble with this. Shouldn't even bother, should I? Schwarzschild was an astrophysicist. He also uh, did work on black holes, and the event horizon in a black hole is to the Schwarzschild. Um, OK, so we want to just solve these equations with d bit tau of u minus d equals 0. And we can actually do that. It's not too difficult. This is the solution. So this is what the up what radiation is the downwards radiation and B, which is B now is not the buoyancy, B is sigma t to the fourth. These are the solutions, a little bit of algebra, won't do the algebra. And what is U of LT? Uh, U of LT, T, is the upwards radiation at the top of the atmosphere. The, the outgoing infrared radiation at the top of the atmosphere. That must now, and we know what that is, because the outgoing infrared radiation at the top of the atmosphere is equal to the incoming solar radiation, because the planet is in equilibrium. So, so we know what, so we'll take that as our boundary condition, because these are, these are ODEs. They're first order ODEs, so they need a single, a single boundary condition. And then, since we've got this tau equals tau naught e to the minus z, we know that gives us, in fact, this solution for the temperature. So we can calculate analytically what the temperature profile is as a function of height in a column. Um, this is, so that L is for long wave, and the assumption is that the atmosphere is transparent to... Yes, that's right. There's no, that's right. There's no, uh, indeed, there is no, do I have an L here? Yes, I have an, that's right. Okay, L here, subscript L, thank you, is long wave. There's no solar absorption, indeed. Um... Yeah, so I secretly introduce an L. And that gives us the temperature as a function of height, knowing what this outgoing long wave radiation is at the top, because I'm just going to take that as a boundary condition, because it's an equilibrium calculation. And I get this, and what does it look like? It looks like this. Well, these are various curves, depending on what the optical depth is. I'm very the optical depth here for a given outgoing radiation. So the outgoing long wave radiation at the top is then determines what the temperature is at the top of the atmosphere. Uh, so the top of the atmosphere, um, oops, I've a little typo here. Forget this T equals. Didn't finish my talk here. At the top of the atmosphere, tau is zero. So B, which is sigma T to the fourth, is the outgoing long wave radiation uh, divided by two. So if we're specifying what the outgoing long wave radiation is, it's equivalent to specifying what the temperature is at the top of the atmosphere in this radiative equilibrium case. And you can see that what it does is it increases rapidly. This is for increasing values of tau 
for increasing values of tau just gets warmer and warmer. And that's why, of course, we have a greenhouse effect. If tau was zero, no greenhouse gases, temperature would be 220 here. At a larger tau, tau is up 360 here. Um, in reality, tau is about three, I guess. Of course, it varies in reality with, you know, as water comes and goes in a particular column, uh, uh, it varies a lot. Um, and here's just same curve with different values of the outgoing long wave radiation. So I'm specifying the outgoing long wave radiation, and that's equivalent to specifying what really what the solar constant is, right? Uh, because the incoming radiation equals the outgoing radiation. One thing about global warming, which we can forget if we're not, or it's easy to forget, after we put CO2 in the atmosphere, the outgoing long wave radiation is going to be the same. Still got to balance the incoming solar radiation. So unless clouds have changed, unless there's more clouds, unless the albedo has changed, we've still got exactly the same outgoing long wave radiation as we have now. Um, OK, so this is the radiative equilibrium temperature increasing like crazy at the bottom of the atmosphere. If it's increasing like crazy, it's really warm at the bottom of the atmosphere. What is that going to give you? It's going to give you convection, right? So that's why we have, that's ultimately, again, why we will have, uh, have convection. And we'll have more convection where it's hot. Um, and um, so we tend to get more convection in the tropics. And what's going to happen? Convection is going to give you a, a lapse rate, which is specified by a, either a dry adiabatic lapse rate or a moist adiabatic lapse rate, depending on whether the moisture is present or not. But it's going to, it's going to, what it's going to do is this. It's going to uh, reduce the temperature gradients here. And so you're going to get convection uh, until this temperature reaches the radiative equilibrium temperature, and then you're no longer unstable. Uh, and this break here is the tropopause. Uh, so we haven't mentioned ozone. Ozone just causes this temperature to go up again up here. It causes this to go up again there. It doesn't really influence, and, and much of the absorption of ozone is, um, is higher up in the stratosphere. So in fact, the, the uh, do I have it? What, uh, my US standard atmosphere is gone. It was right at the back. But uh, the, the, uh, the US standard atmosphere has got a fairly isothermal stratosphere until you get up to the upper stratosphere. So this is for the tropics, right? What about the extra? What about the, the extra tropics, the same. In fact, the same argument applies. Uh, Why is the extra tropical atmosphere uh, lower? That's a, that's a deeper question than... Uh, that's, a, that's a rather deep question, um, which I'm not going to answer right now, because I'm not sure I know the answer. Um, the... This same argument applies um, because all I'm certainly um, in the absence of anything, in the absence of any other motion, the middle latitudes would still be unstable. If there were no other, you know, if there were no other circulation, the middle latitudes would still be unstable. So you'd still have convection. If, if you didn't have a large scale circulation, uh, you know, you would just be in, uh, in one of these regimes here, like this green curve, would still be unstable. Uh, but in fact, the mid-latitudes are, are less convectively unstable 
than the tropics because the large-scale motion uh, bioclinic instability is also actually uh, moving heat upwards. So, we, so what actually happens in the atmosphere in the middle latitudes is that you just get a difference that this uh, lapse rate here is not so much driven by convection, but it's driven by bioclinic instability, the large-scale eddies which are shifting heat up. Uh, so, uh, so then you can um, we can actually calculate what this height is. Um, I mean, the, it's. China, can you explain this curve? So you have one curve for the radiative equilibrium. Yeah, I have one curve for the radiative equilibrium, and then I'm going to imagine that it adjusts. Uh, let's say because of convection, and convection is specifying a lapse rate. Yeah. So what specifies the point at the surface of the curve? Well, that's a that is a. That is the key question, Franco. <laughs> that is the key question. But let's, um, let's, all right, you so. You the, the scale height of the absorber to get any of this, right? Yeah. One could argue that the convection for all the dynamics is sort of fundamental to what determines that water vapor distribution. You know, yes, you could do that, yes. But let's, let's not do that. <laughs> let's, uh, let's assume yeah, let's, uh, let's assume no matter what, this scale height here, h, is going to be of order of a couple of kilometers. Because it's lot, if te temperature falls off, it's, it's, of course it's going to affect things quantitatively. But the amount of water vapor falls off with temperature. Uh, so we'll assume that we know that. And then... Okay, this is then Franco asked the question what determines this intercept? And that puzzled me for a long time, and I should give credit here to my colleague Pablo Zorito Goto. Uh, and we confused each other for about six months before we figured it out, sort of. Um, this is the radiative equilibrium temperature. Let's, for my first assumption, let's just assume, then we have this red line, which I, uh, which we don't have any red chalk, but let's assume that it starts from here. And we specify the lapse rate, and then it will go up to there. And, that, and then that would be the height of the tropopause. Now, and then that is... Um, that is what I've actually done in this calculation, in this first calculation. Take the surface temperature equal to the radiative equilibrium temperature. Uh, so if I know what this lapse rate is, and I know what this temperature is, I go up to here, and that gives me this value of the tropopause here. But that's too high that's too high of a value because, in fact, it's, it, starts, uh, it starts down like this. It, 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 um, do you want to equal area constraints? Yeah, actually you don't. That was our first thought. But you don't because, um, because let's, it's something a little bit like an equal area constraint. Where's the, let's, Suppose we move it, we make another guess, and we take it here and we go up to here. Uh, now, what we've done, 
we've said, if we, if we do this, if we guess this slightly arbitrarily and go up to here, we'll get the outgoing radiation correct. The outgoing radiation U would be sigma t to the fourth. But then let's do the radiative calculation backwards and go down from the top uh, with this temperature profile and solve the radiative transfer equations down from the, going from the top down. And that would give us what the upwards radiation is as a, as a function of height. And it will give us some value here, knowing what the temperature is there and the temperature profile is there. And it will give us something u at the bottom equals something. Something. Don't know what that is yet. Be a function of how high this is. This something we know has to equal sigma t ground to the fourth because that's the radiation which is being emitted by the ground. But it won't be if I do it, if I choose this height arbitrarily. I have to choose it in a special way so that, it, so that the upwards radiation at the bottom of the atmosphere is equal to sigma Tg to the fourth because that's essentially the way of getting the entire atmosphere into equilibrium. So what you actually have to do is do an iterative calculation. You guess where it is, you go down to the bottom, you see if that upwards radiation is sigma Tg to the fourth. If it isn't, you adjust. And the atmosphere does that, does that itself. Uh, there's many clever iterative algorithms built into nature. Um, so it gets it. And in fact, and this is what we did with Pablo, um, we can calculate what this height is um, doing it analytically. And it's a rather complicated calculation. Uh, and it gives you that. So um, now, and that gives you about you, the various constants in here. I should stop for a break, I guess. Um, gamma is the lapse rate. TT is the temperature of the tropopause, which we know. It's that temperature up there. Tau is the temperature at the surface. HA is the scale height. So that gets in as a parameter. And we get this formula. And uh, just two other quick things. When we, or one other quick thing, if we have global warming, the outgoing long wave radiation stays the same after we've got to equilibrium because incoming solar is outgoing infrared. But we know it warms because that's the greenhouse effect. So it goes from, that's our original uh, tropopause temperature profile. It warms to give us this red line because of global warming. The temperature of the tropopause has to stay the same. So the temperature of the tropopause has to increase with global warming. And it, I'm sorry, the height, thank you. The height of the tropopause has to increase, and it's one of the most robust predi predictions, aside from the fact that temperature will increase. The height of the tropopause has to increase. And um, I'll just skip that. It would also, the lapse rate also causes things to change because the most adiabatic lapse rate changes. So if you know about that, the, the fact that the lapse rate changes uh, makes things actually go up a little bit more. If you don't know about the most adiabatic lapse rate, don't, don't worry about that. Just think of this. So you can predict that the height of the tropopause, putting the numbers in, goes up about 300 meters for each degree rise in temperature, which is actually kind of significant. And this, by the way, my own is CMIP. I took away all my CMIP slides after John's talk, <laughs> except for this one. <laughs> uh, this is the uh, 
these are these little dot. Well, this is th this is the height of the tropopause in a whole bunch of CMIP models as a function of latitude, uh, and it's, this is meters per decade. So, you know, they they're all varying, but on average, the CMIP models are increasing in heights by about 70 meters per decade, and uh, which is kind of not insignificant, especially if you're an airline and you want to fly in the stratosphere to get above the weather, you're going to have to fly higher. OK, so um, let's stop and have a, but let's not have half an hour, otherwise we'll never finish. Let's come back in 20 minutes or something or less if you can. <laughs>